Hey, look who that is. And he's out of the studio. Welcome to No Apologies with Becker on Beck. And I'm Lori Hins. Today I know it looks a little different <laughs> because this might be a little bit confusing for you. But I'm in studio and Dr. Rick Becker is out on assignment today. So he is remoting in. Hi. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well. The truth is I have not taken over the program. The truth is I did take over your parking spot, however. So. <laughs> Well, I get it back. Yeah, you, you'll get it back, too. So we're, uh, we're via Zoom today. You're on assignment. Are you going to tell us where you are, or is it just a secret location? Well, if, if I tell you where I'm at, I'm not going to be able to get all of the data from the government that I'm trying to tease out. So yeah, I'm just nice. I'm, I'm on location. Well, we're going to start uh, today with our very first topic, and our topic today is a little bit about something that we've teased a couple of times previously, and that is that uh, the governor has put out a proposed budget. Now, this budget is $15 billion, which is only the second biggest <laughs> one that's ever been proposed in the state of North Dakota. Uh, Governor Dalrymple had one that was a little bit larger. That one was $15.78 billion. And the legislature at one point then managed to trim it and bring it down to um, about $14.2 billion. So there's never really been a $15 billion one before. So, uh, you want to weigh in on this one, Rick? Yeah, uh, Laurie, uh, Governor Burgum, you're right. Uh, proposed a fifteen billion dollar budget. It's I think it's fifteen billion nineteen million something like that. Uh, so, if it does go through as proposed, which it won't, but if it were at that level, it would be a record budget ever. Um, so that's substantial, uh, re really, really big. The, there's a lot of uh, interesting tidbits in there. One of the things, Laurie, is that um, it's good to know when people hear about the governor's budget uh, to understand it's a budget proposal. The budgeting is done by the legislature. The, the actual appropriations of monies fully done by the legislature. Now, over the last many years, the legislature has kind of relinquished its duty more or less to the governor, to the executive branch. And in part, uh, that made sense, at least in the beginning, because of course the governor's office, they're there all year round. The legislature is only there four months every other year. And so it's maybe hard to stay on top of things to really you know, make sure you, you know all the details all the way through all 24 months of the biennium. Uh, and so they, 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 they gave more power, if you will, to the governor's office to come up with this budget. Now it's not power per se, but they, what the, the, where the power lies is that the budget's proposed, I'm, I'm sorry, the governor's proposed budget was then pretty much taken by the legislature and they would just tweak it. They do little tweaks on the edges, do a little this, do a little that, and then it became the budget. And so in effect, the governor had a lot of power. Now what we've been trying to do for the last several years, not just since Governor Bergen, but for the last several years, is to try and pull some of that, some of that responsibility back where it's supposed to be. And so um, back in Governor Dalrymple's last term, for instance, we started to work on that and pulling it back and say, okay, governor, we, we respect your proposed budget, but we are going to really look at it and, and, and do our own thing. We're gonna take into consideration what you're saying. Governor Burgum's most recent uh, proposed budget is where really um, you know things hit the fan a little bit because that's where we took the next step to pull way back and say, we're, we're gonna acknowledge that you put a proposed budget in there, but we're really gonna basically start from scratch. We're going to do our own thing. Governor Bergen pretty much took it personally, um, from what I understand. And so there was a lot of conflict there, a lot of uh, friction. Mm -hmm. um, but we are moving forward uh, with the way we've been doing things. As you and I discussed recently, um, Representative Jeff Delzer, Appropriations Chair, is back in after a very unusual circumstance. And so he is very much a proponent of the legislature taking back some of that responsibility. So Governor Bergen is proposing this budget, but it's simply a proposal that the legislature can look at and say, hey, great ideas here, not so great there, and they're right. going to do their own thing. Well, can we take a little bit look, uh, a little look at least uh, at some of the more specific things with regard to his budget too? And you know, when you look at that budget, you know that the, the legislature is not going to let every single thing go through. There's just no way that, that that could possibly happen. So when he proposes, I suppose he shoots for the moon a little bit and then expects to um, win some and some losing, but I don't know. Maybe he doesn't think that he's going to lose any, any ground. 
Well, he has to be anticipating he's going to lose a little ground with the way the dynamics have been with the legislature over the past six months to a year. So mm -hmm. um, probably where he might shoot for the moon is specific pet projects to really um, sure. fund those maximally in hopes that if the legislature pulls back on those projects to some degree, that he still gets them at least partially funded. Um, and so he, we to... he definitely is looking at some interesting things and, and uh, some of them are good, some are bad. I'm gonna hit that a little bit at the next segment as well. All right. uh, well but clearly a, there are some areas here. that he is um, wanting to work on. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, yes, right, right now we have the bonding issue. That's one of his big, big things. So the bonding basically is that you're, you're loaning, you're, you're lending money or you're borrowing money rather. Right. And it's to do whatever projects you believe are important to do and mm -hmm. timely to do. And so what, what Governor Burgum is proposing is to have a $1.25 billion uh, bond or loan, in other words, and do special projects. Uh, most of them are infrastructure. A lot of them have to do with uh, what I call corporate welfare, what other people might call um, economic diversification and things like that. <laughs> so it's that that's a very interesting component uh, interestingly, the legislature uh, is proposing, at least specific legislators are proposing to also do bonding, but in, in a little bit of a, a different um, sort of uh, way of, of, of addressing it and what they want to right. do with the money. But both the governor and some of the specific legislators are thinking that it's a good idea to borrow money to do special projects, and we'll see where it goes. So they're of this of similar mindsets the question is will they agree on what to spend it on and in my mind the bigger question is should we really be doing that at all right i, I was just thinking back to having our guest on um, not long ago we had kelly schmidt on and she said do not spend that legacy fund she you know she's pretty adamant about that too uh does that come into play at all with the governor's budget did you um ferret out yeah. anything mm -hmm. very good very good question so another thing the viewers should know is with the legacy fund of course that was put in place uh, on a vote at, uh, by the voters i think in 2010 and so 30 percent of the oil money goes into this legacy fund and we can't really touch it uh, we can spend the legislator legislature can spend uh, a maximum of 15 percent of the of the legacy fund per biennium but it takes a two-thirds vote now the the loophole is that we can spend the earnings so right. there's at this point of six, seven billion dollars in the legacy fund, and of course it's invested and it, it earns money. And I believe that they're looking at about a $500 million earnings, interest in earnings on the legacy fund. So the, the legislature can spend all $500 million of those earnings. If they didn't spend the earnings, then the earnings would go into the uh, legacy fund itself and become principal and grow that much more. So yes, Governor Burgum is looking at spending all of the earnings. Now, the legislature has spent uh, most or all of the earnings for the past couple of sessions anyway, and, and there's been some debate on that, some good debate on whether we should be doing it or if we are spending it, if we're spending it on the appropriate things. Uh, but in Governor Burgum's budget, all of the legacy fund earnings are being spent. And in fact, the plan is for future earnings, the interest and earnings on the legacy fund that are going to come in two, four, six, ten. 20 years, 40% of those earnings are going to be spent on things that Governor Burgum wants to borrow money for now for the projects he's interested in. So that's so, an, another interesting thing. Well, in the, in the one minute we have left here, if you could make a prediction on what you think is, it's going to be clashing, do you think? I mean, what's, what's, your, what's your best idea of what's going to happen with the legislature versus the, the governor's proposal? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I don't. I, I think that there is not going to be a situation where there's animosity and the legislature intentionally does something the governor doesn't want. However, I think that there's enough friction that the, legislate, the legislature as a whole, certainly the Appropriations Committee, is not going to have any qualms if they disagree uh, with anything in the governor's budget where they say, you know what, we're going to jettison that. Thank you very much for your, for your opinion, for your suggestion, but here's what we're going to do instead. So I think that uh, I think the budget, as the legislature brings it out by the end of April, is going to be substantially different than the governor's budget. Now, on the other hand, 
both the governor and the legislature are probably going to be up in that $15 billion range because we essentially always spend everything that comes in. <laughs> Uh, Anything that's problem. available, and we'll, we'll, we'll spend it, I'm, I'm sure. So thank you very much for, for doing Absolutely. this with me today so I don't have to do this all by myself. That would have been really ugly. So we're going to come back in just a moment, and we will talk a little bit about the same subject, but Rick's going to give a little bit. We call it a Rick's rant. We'll be right back. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink from trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. For the greatest selection and full menu offering, it's the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfast served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street, Garrison. Are you a thrill seeker, sightseer, or day tripper? The Ford Bronco Sport SUV is built for you. Four Bears Casino is giving away a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport loaded with a ton of interior space, safari style roof, smooth suspension for any terrain, and easy to clean surfaces. Qualify now just by playing your favorite slots at Four Bears Casino. Double points on Sundays. Also get in on Super Senior Wednesdays, slot turning Thursdays, and hot seats on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Spin into Four Bears Casino and Lodge for chances to win. things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. Welcome back to No Apologies with Becker on Beck. I know I'm not Becker, but I am pinch hitting today while uh, Rick Meister is on <laughs> is on assignment today. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna call you all sorts of things today just because I can. <laughs> but uh, we are we were talking last segment. If you're just joining us, we were talking a little bit about the governor's budget and a little bit about um, what it means and what's going to happen with the legislature. And Rick, uh, your rant tonight is a little bit about um, what's probably good and what's great in his budget and probably what not so much. So um, yes. your take on it is what we're looking for tonight. Right. So so you set me up uh, with good, bad, and ugly. And um, <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of the viewers may know, uh, Governor Burgum and I don't necessarily see eye to eye. I'm frequently taking him to task for I'm various shocked. things. Um, I'm shocked. However, if I'm looking at the budget, uh, quite honestly, I can say that there are several things in there that I think are good. And uh, there, are, there are a few things that primarily deal with efficiencies. 
So Governor Burgum, being a business person, is very much involved. Oh, here, I just want to comment on this graphic. This is when Governor Burgum was giving his budget uh, proposal, his proposed budget, to the legislature uh, back on December 3rd, I think it was. And uh, just for kicks, I wanted to point out, you see the guy in the background wearing a Guy Fox mask, or maybe the viewers might know Guy Fox mask as the V for Vendetta mask. So that was me back there. And it was just kind of, I was being silly more or less, but I wanted to put a mask on kind of like, you know, hey, I'm anti-government or whatever. So anyway, I just had fun with it. Like always, I try to, I try to keep things light. Um, but, but back to Governor Burgum and, and what he's doing that's good. He's looking for efficiencies. As a businessman, he likes to find efficiencies and it makes a lot of sense. He has identified several areas in state government where we can become more efficient. So I applaud him for that. You know, my concern is that the foundation, as a person who's leading the state philosophically or with political principles, is that a, a limited government that respects uh, freedom and, and, and maximizes liberty, reduces taxes, all of that is really paramount. Everything else follows. So his efficiency, seeking efficiency is fantastic in so far as those efficiencies translate to less government intrusion, less taxes, people keep more of their money, they have better economic freedom and so forth. My concern is that those efficiencies that he's finding are so that government can do the job better and, and can do more jobs, more solve more problems, be more involved, but at the same level of cost. So there's a, in my mind, there's a huge difference between those two things. However, let's look at those good things. Um, he wants to reduce the physical footprint. There are a tremendous number of employees, a tremendous number of agencies that are renting space all throughout Bismarck, all throughout sure. the state. He's trying to bring those in, allow people to do more remote work. And in theory, then we, the state can reduce its physical footprint and not be renting so many places. That'll be more efficient, cost less. Um, he is asking the... Uh, state employees to contribute one percent more to their retirement that might not seem like a big thing but future liabilities are something that you may hear about and that is for instance the pensions and the retirement that are coming down the road that we uh, as legislators and citizens say yes you can have these great packages the problem is that it's future generations that have to pay those and right now they're they're unfunded they're they're not the, the whole program is not solvent by getting the state employees to contribute a little bit more, it will, over the course of time, become solvent and won't be a liability for our kids and grandkids. Um, there's a, a another one, IT unification. Um, and what we're looking there is the, the problem of redundancy, uh, especially with the information technology where every agency has its own and it's it's not uniform it's it, there it's disparate it doesn't work well together not only does it make it so that it's outdated and there's problems and in my opinion there's a huge risk for uh hacking into the state pro uh, uh it systems mm -hmm. um but just overall it would save money so that that's the good the bad <laughs> governor Burgum says return on investment a lot and that's the problem with bureaucrats in government is they think about spending taxpayers money as an investment um, and it's not an investment you're just spending money and it's a subjective opinion on whether you think you're getting enough back um, in services for right. the people well you know that's a again very subjective and it's not a it's not an investment uh, the other thing is that he talks a lot about the general fund so the state spending, it comes from many funds. We talk a lot about the general fund, but my concern is that throws a little bit of a, uh, a distraction or curveball to people because you can talk about the general fund. And in fact, from the last biennium, he uh, pronounced through his media spokesperson that, that he reduced spending by 12%. Well, what he really meant is he reduced spending from the general fund by 12%. But spending increased dramatically because what you can do is you just, you know, the way the way it works is we move money around. It's a shell game. So you can have money that comes away from the general fund, goes to another fund, spend it all out of that fund. And yet somehow you can say there's less spending from the general fund. So my concern is there's so much focus on general fund, but that's only one segment and it doesn't tell the whole story and it can be misleading. Right. Uh, another bad thing, a lot of corporate corporate welfare. 
Uh, that is something that Governor Burgum is a proponent of, generally speaking, when you hear about his Main Street initiative. Um, there's corporate welfare, uh, in other words, subsidies and all of these other things for, for drones. There's housing incentives, innovation loans, um, various grant programs. And uh, again, I think that that's not how we as individual taxpayers would want our tax dollars spent. Uh, another area that I think is bad is that he is not willing to look for savings in K-12 education and human services. Those two areas are considered you know, sacred. Right. Um, the, the problem is politically, it's a hot potato. There's no doubt you can't cut funding to schools or kids and you can't cut funding to human services. However, we know with as much money as going to those two areas, there are areas of efficiency we can find. There's waste, there's redundancy. We have to be able to do something. We're spending more per student in K-12 than our neighbors, but our testing isn't any improved at all with all of that increased spending. That says to me that the spending has not been done wisely. Exactly. And let's get to the ugly. Um, <laughs> for me, the ugly, one of the big things is borrowing. We, we have had so much money, so much increased spending over the last 10 years to borrow from future generations, even though it's paid with legacy fund earnings, it's still money that is coming in the future and that future uh, generations, if you will, should have the uh, uh, ability to decide how they want to spend it. Right. If we want to do new projects, we don't have the money readily available to us. Instead of borrowing, what we need to do is figure out areas where we can cut spending. And you take the money from where you've cut and you put it into those areas that you now suddenly see the need for increased spending. So borrowing from the future, I think, is, is horrible. And uh, another area is, again, if this passes, this is a record budget. North Dakota spending has been on a trajectory that has been ridiculous. Almost nothing like it has been seen in the past 150 years in the United States. And somehow we are going to maintain that level of spending, despite our reduced GDP because of COVID, despite the reduced revenue from oil taxes because of the crash in oil prices, all of those things happen and we're not reducing our spending. Instead, we're saying, hey, we're going to borrow money so we can keep the level of spending up here. I was very disappointed in that. I would love to have seen some leadership um, to be able to say, look, folks, things are different. We need to pull back a little bit. Uh, we've been crazy. The party's been really heavy, and we've partied on spending <laughs> every dollar that has come in. <laughs> it's time to uh, strap down a little bit, and uh, we're going to look at things differently. He has not well, done we that. We shall so, definitely see what happens. There you it's have it, Lori. Good, bad, and ugly event. on the budget nice. proposal from well the Well done on the rant. Thank you so much. Um, next, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, Rick and I, about SCOTUS. SCOTUS is Supreme Court of the United States, and the Texas lawsuit. We'll hit that when we come back. ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans, let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. In southwestern and south central North Dakota, on any given day at any given moment, a Dakota Community Bank and Trust customer is logging in or signing on to do their online or mobile banking. We believe that community banking can blend both the past with down-home customer service in-house and the future with modern banking conveniences and technology for our customers anywhere, like here or here, all while honoring our long-standing tradition of community-first oriented banking here at Dakota Community Bank and Trust. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even tied worked out to be 
pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running, no matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. Welcome back. It's good to see you. <laughs> and even though you're not in the studio, uh, you're watching right now uh, No Apologies with Becker. And Becker is on the right hand side, and I am in the studio, and he is remoting in today, which is working actually pretty slick, I have to say. Did I say that out loud? That's like the kiss of death, isn't it? I'm so sorry about that. Uh, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased that you're be, being able to, you know, be in touch with us, even though you're not necessarily right here at the desk. I've got the desk. I've got the desk. I've got your parking, and I've got the desk. Uh, so we're going to talk next about the Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton. On Tuesday morning, he decided that he was going to file a, um, well, it was a brief with, a, a filed a lawsuit, and everybody else is glomming on with, with briefs, or with their amicus. Amicus uh, am briefs, yeah. Am 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 and then and Trump with his uh, intervener. Right, so, and his yeah. intervener, too. So he filed this lawsuit against four states, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, at the United States Supreme Court for allegedly exploiting the COVID-19 pandemic to justify ignoring federal and state election laws and unlawfully enacting last minute changes, which they did, and skewing the results of the 2020 general election. There's a lot of feelings on both sides on this one that some are saying, well, this is a frivolous and ridiculous lawsuit. It's not going to go anywhere. But the fact of the matter is that those states did go against their constitution. So trust in the integrity of the election process, he says in this is sacrosanct and binds our citizenry and the uh, states in this union together, binds us together. Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin destroyed that trust, he says, and comprised, uh, compromised the security and integrity of the 2020 election. The states violated statutes enacted by their duly elected legislature, thereby violating the Constitution. Yeah. So. Very, yeah, it's a, I, I would say it was a, an ambitious uh, lawsuit and uh, not that it's good or bad, but, but uh, I would say that there's even a, a level of audacity to the Texas AG. Um, and it's, I find this fascinating. I'm going to be interested to see what the Supreme Court says. Uh, I, as a person who believes very much in federalism, meaning that the states are sovereign and the 10th amendment and so forth, the idea that Texas could come in and say anything about Georgia or any of these other states seems pretty iffy. On the other hand, what Texas is referring to is in the United States Constitution that the legislatures are the only ones that can make the rules for how the elections are run. And so perhaps Texas might have standing uh, because clearly some of the states have changed the rules uh, without the legislature on how the elections were, were done. So I'm not sure. This is very interesting from a, from a legal standpoint, from a state's rights standpoint. Um, and of course, the ramifications, if the Supreme Court takes, takes it up, are, are crazy. Right. Well, and more and more states keep jumping on and jumping on. And so it 
to me, I think that adds credence to their worries if all of the states <laughs> that are getting involved are doing so and saying, hey, listen, we, we want to be in on this too because we think this is screwed the election. All of, those, all of those voters in all of those different states are feeling like they have been disenfranchised because somebody cheated or somebody used a different set of rules for them. And it's not, it's not really a fraud lawsuit. It's really not about fraud. The lawsuit itself is about a different topic. It's actually about the fact that uh, they changed the rules before the election, which skewed the outcome. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um... It, I'm so I'm so torn on how I feel about this, and and it's a lot of states. North Dakota has jumped on, and and I can tell you, I was in various threads uh, of messages of both constituents and legislators that are you know very much in favor of North Dakota being on it, um, and <laughs> there's so much that that rides on this. I do think that there's a certain political nature to it, of course. I mean, it's it's impossible for there not to be. All of the states that jumped on are, you know, what are known as red states. Um, obviously, a Democrat state is probably not going to be in, uh, interested in trying to overturn anything. Uh, and, and so it's, it's politicized, like everything has been, and there's this whole um, 10th Amendment aspect to it. But uh, by, the, by the time this is actually determined on whether the Supreme Court is going to hear it, I wonder how many states are going to be on board. Right. I don't know. Well, it'll be interesting to see. This is definitely this is definitely a different tack. We um, have seen so many different things going on with legal things that everybody else is like, oh, it's another lawsuit. It's probably not going to go anywhere. It's not going to be. But this one actually may have teeth just simply because those four states that that uh, A.G. Paxton named did actually violate constitutional things. And so it's going to be interesting to see, like you say, what, what's going on. I do have to tell you that I called the Attorney General's office myself in hopes that I could urge him to do this as well. And when I when I got on the phone, uh, the, the person who answered the phone said, are you calling about the Texas lawsuit? And that's all they said. And I said, yes, I absolutely am. She goes, OK, thank you. Bye. Click. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. So I am guessing that there were probably thousands of us who probably called the Attorney General's office, because especially after um, many of the other states were were jumping on board then north dakota of course had to as well yeah the attorney general initially was indicating uh, not much interest in joining but i do believe that it was specifically because of the citizenry as well as legislators uh making multiple pleas to jump on board that that we are in fact on board um there, yeah there's no question so that, that's kind of nice to see you know that the citizens the citizens exactly. are heard well, and I'm, I'm assuming in those other states, that's probably exactly what happened, too. So that means all across the country, people are paying attention. At least they're paying attention, and that's all you can ask for. People who are interested in making sure that there is a transparent and yeah. fair election, that all the votes are counted, that everything is done the correct way. There are no different rules for me and thee. And the, the thing that's interesting to me about this lawsuit, that it has really, it names COVID right in the lawsuit. It actually um, says, you know, due to COVID, they use that as an excuse to thwart the regular election rules. Yeah, yeah. My prediction, though, <laughs> much like all of my <laughs> predictions regarding the presidential election, Laurie, are not ones that will make you happy. But I don't I think know. that anything is actually going to come of this. Um, if it were, wow, would that be interesting? Think about that. The Monday uh, is when the electors uh, cast their votes, if you will, right. and, and it's a done deal at that point. So let's say that the Supreme Court takes it up. What can happen? I mean, everything is off, and it probably, because if they take it up, it means it has to be heard in court. If right. that's the case, it goes past Monday the 14th, and in essence, then, from my what I understand, it would then be a determination of the House of Representatives to Correct. determine the next president. Exactly. And, think and, about uh, that. Think of the ramifications the, of that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, think of the ramifications of that. That means that those individual um, individual congressmen then go and they get one vote per state. It's a totally different exactly. thing. And exactly. that's going to be. I mean, and if you look at that, I think it's. I want to say it's like. 29 to 20 and then there's one independent or it's it's a really it's i don't recall ever hearing that anything like this was ever going to happen before this did not happen with the with the gore and bush thing no, 10, no. 10 years ago at all that was you know that was 37 days this would be going longer than that and then having to 
reconcile it. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're and you're right. And that's the kind of the the interesting thing to note is just exactly what you've said. But I'll reiterate: it goes to the House of Representatives, which is Democrat controlled. But instead of one person, one vote for congressman, it's one state, one vote. And there happens to be more Republican states uh, as far as a majority of congressmen than than Democrat. And so it would go to whoever the Republicans in the House would want. So really, really weird. Like you said, never happened before. I don't expect it's going to happen this time. But if the Supreme Court takes it up, I don't know what else could come of it except that. Welcome to 2020. Anything <laughs> okay. can happen at this point in this year. So uh, we are not going to be able to solve this or give you more information about this until things actually just progress on it. But we wanted to at least make people aware of what the situation is and what's going on. So when we come back, we are going to be talking about brain food. Love me some brain food. And we've got some interesting brain food for you tonight. We'll be right back. Howdy folks, it's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you'll do for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at our salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattle and pie with a combo that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Since opening in Hebron in 1940, Dakota Community Bank and Trust has been your hometown bank. Our mission has been to provide modern banking convenience with old-fashioned hometown service. We've grown with the communities we serve. Through year-round events, countless sponsorships, and nearly 7,000 hours of volunteering each year. Learn more about our 80-year history at dakotacommunitybank.com. Jeez, what a mess. Look at that. There's roof stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans. Let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. For the greatest selection and full menu offering is the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfasts served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street, Garrison. Are you a thrill seeker, sightseer, or day tripper? The Ford Bronco Sport SUV is built for you. Four Bears Casino is giving away a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport loaded with a ton of interior space, safari-style roof, smooth suspension for any terrain, and easy-to-clean surfaces. Qualify now just by playing your favorite slots at Four Bears Casino. Double points on Sundays. Also get in on Super Senior Wednesdays, slot-turning Thursdays, and hot seats on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Spin into Four Bears Casino and Lodge for chances to win. things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. Welcome back to No Apologies with Becker on Beck. I'm Lori Hins, not necessarily Becker at the desk today, but he is here with us uh, remotely as we are doing our show today, which is super cool. So hello. So we're doing brain food tonight. This is, as you know, is always one of my favorite things to do. And uh, we have a theme this evening. Our theme is German things. So we're doing German things. And my very first one, Rick, is, is, call, is a word that comes from mental floss. It's called Corona spec. Now, Corona spec is one of mental floss's uh, words again. This is a German word, uh, Kummerspec, K-U-M-M-E-R, literally 
translates to grief bacon. <laughs> and it refers, of course, to the weight that you gain during overeating when you're emotional. I am an emotional eater, so I totally understand this. And according to the experts at Babel, in German, the word speck, and you may know this because there's lots of Germans around our area here in Bismarck, but in German, the word speck is used to refer to the bacon-like pork fat found in a bratwurst or a sausage. Uh, when you pair that with Corona, Germans have created an expression for the weight gained in lockdown. <laughs> so yeah. um, Corona spec emotional eating, yeah. done it. Yeah. Well, that's totally so one of the words, I'm, I'm all uh, Germans from Russia is my background. And uh, yeah, there'd be a little, you'd say, oh, you got a little speck on you there if, uh, if you're gonna <laughs> right? tease someone exactly. about maybe gaining a little weight. So no doubt you about to, that. You know, put that um, speck directly onto the hips. Yes, right. Just skip perfect. the middleman, just slather it right on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my uh, first piece of brain food is uh, Otto von Bismarck. It is the person who was, uh, who Bismarck was named after. Uh, very interesting, very powerful person in Germany uh, in the early 1800s to mid 1800s. And um, he was known best for the unification of Germany. He was a very powerful player, very skilled at politics and uh, was able to sort of bring different areas of Germany. There were, there were basically all sorts of different territories or countries. And basically he brought them all together, except for Austria. He said, forget you, Austria, we don't <laughs> want you. Uh, again, it was part of, part of the political maneuvering he did as he was very masterful at that. Interestingly for me, being a citizen of Bismarck, uh, much to my chagrin, Otto von Bismarck is also known for being the first person to bring about a modern welfare state. Oh, uh, no. State. Yes. <laughs> well, so he brought I'm not about gonna lie. He looked a little crabby to me there. programs. And again, for him, it was all calculation. It was political calculation. The socialists, the socialist party in Germany at that time, was making a play to take power. And what Otto von Bismarck did is said, you know what, I'm gonna beat you at your own game. I'm gonna tell all of the, uh, the, the, the workers, the labor people, the people that would be in the labor party, the socialist party at that time, uh, I'm gonna give them all the stuff that you're saying you want to give them, and then they have no reason to join forces with you. I stay in power, I win, it's all good. So yes, Otto brought about welfare. Tough. <laughs> nice. Well, he looked a little cranky in that picture to me. He did not look like a very happy human being. But Germans, I mean, we have just kind of a natural, well, I'm saying we because I'm half German. So you can probably do the cranky face better than I could do that because you're all German. But um, I might, <laughs> no? Yeah, I, think, I think you have to have a, a kind of a cranky face just to speak German. You know, it's a very <laughs> true, harsh language. You know, it, that's, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> Something exactly. Like so yeah. so my, my second one, I'm going to do my best German version of this one, is Hamsterkopf or Hamsterkopf. Uh, you can use the term the next time you see shoppers frantically grabbing toilet paper off the, the store shelves. Uh, the German words hamster or hamster and Kopf, which means buying, means hamster buying, are uh, joined metaphorically to compare supermarket raiders to hamsters who, you know what they do, and they just stock up on food for an entire winter. They stuff, stuff their cheeks full of all sorts of things. And um, <laughs> if you've ever seen somebody, if you've ever seen somebody, sorry about that. If you've ever seen somebody hoarding something and you know, we've all probably been in the store and seen people take, you know, three or four of something where it says, the sign says specifically, you can have one of these. Then that is what a uh, hamster cough is. It's hoarding it's they're both kind of corona related and also german at the same time so yeah interesting very interesting yeah. okay for my last bit on brain food mm -hmm. uh and sticking with the theme i am going to go with um well first up as i mentioned i am uh my my background is all germans from russia so right. the germans that went over to russia and got some free land and a free donkey and a free cow uh, because in Germany at the time, they were constantly in wars. And so Catherine the Great said, hey, Germans, come on over. You guys are hard workers. Work this area. I'll give you some land. They did about eight, 1800. And then by 1900, they all left Ger uh, Russia. They had maintained their own community. So they, they stuck as like the, the same individuals 
um, without mixing into the Russian population too much. And then Russia said, hey, let's get those Germans, uh, conscript them, in other words, draft them uh, into World War I. And the Germans, my, my ancestor said, you know, forget that, we're going to go over to America. And uh, so they did. So that's Germans from Russia. But now there is a Germans from Russia Heritage Society. It's in Bismarck and it's for the whole region. Uh, back when I was in college, I was doing some studies. I actually took a course in, at UND, believe it or not, uh, Germans from Russia was a history course. I took that. Um, but the Morton County, I think at the time in the 80s when I was in college, 40% of the population of Morton County was all full Germans from Russia. Um, but this Heritage Society, I wanted to bring up, I don't know if it's officially their motto, I didn't call and ask them, but they do have a little bit of a, a little sculpture in front of their building. Um, and it says, uh, Arbeit macht das Leben süß. And what that means is work makes life sweet. And I really oh. like that. It's, it's, it's um, I think it tells a lot about, about my ancestors and they're pretty serious folks. They're extremely hardworking. But one of the things that, I hope to flesh out over the course of our many shows, Laurie, is this, this idea of the dignity of work. And we right. recently had a show on Walter Williams um, where we talked about that. And he, he wrote about that um, in particular. And um, there's something about dignity and self-worth when you're, when you're out there and you're working and you produce. And I really, when I saw that from the Germans from Russia Heritage Society, that stuck out at me and I kind of was proud of that. And uh, so there's there's a little bit of brain food for you. That is fantastic. And that's so, and it's so apropos for our community too. Anybody who is watching this show and it is not from the community probably doesn't realize that that's our jam here is hard workers and people who take pride in their work. And, and I love that, that's fantastic. That our Arbeit macht das Leben süß. Yeah, pretty Other good, yes. <laughs> I'm just faking Zeus. my way through. Zeus. Anyway, fantastic. Brain food tonight is um, is my favorite. We, we, I love it. So next we are going to be talking, and this is our final topic for the evening already, and the, it's actually flying by, but we will discuss the possibility of vaccine IDs. Not sure I'm a big fan of any type of vaccine IDs, but I guess we'll find out Rick's take when we come back with no apologies in just a moment. Howdy folks, it's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you'll do for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at our salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink for trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even title worked out to be pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I, I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running. 
No matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. Well, this has definitely been a unique version of No Apologies with Becker on Beck. Uh, me in studio here in Bismarck and elsewhere, Rick Becker, um, zooming in here today. It's working, it's it's working, so we're, we're doing it. Our last uh, topic, yeah, in our last topic tonight, we are going to talk a little bit about the possibility of vaccine ID cards. It has been brought up. The um, Department of Defense, of all things, released pictures um, on the 2nd of December, and they were <laughs> showing these re vaccin vaccination record cards that people could carry around with them. And I immediately got a little concerned about that, not really impressed with that whole thing. I don't know. What's your take on that, Rick? Well, I think uh, <laughs> it's, a, yeah, I'm not impressed at all with it. Um, the, I think it's important to know what the basis is of, to have those. And I'm not sure if people know, but the vaccine is supposed to be given twice to be effective. And uh, the idea allegedly behind the card is you get it once and then they write it down on a card, you keep the card with you. Uh, I'm not sure why they say keep it with you at all times. I mean, essentially you just need to <laughs> refer to it and see, okay, when do I go back and get my second dose? Uh, but, but that's the way all these things start, right? It's like, oh, it just, it, it's just a card and it, it helps remind you when you need to get your second dose. And um, the next thing you know, it's a lot more than that. And I don't think it's, conspiratorial. Um, I, I think it's just the nature. We all know many examples of how this type of thing goes. Because if the vaccine becomes uh, something that is mandated, then of course mm -hmm. the card, what, if the vaccine is mandated, what's the problem with the card being mandated that you have to carry it with you to go exactly. here or there or anywhere else? On the other hand, the card would be even more important if the vaccine is only strongly encouraged and not mandated because then you could have a situation where it's like, hey, it's totally your choice. You don't have to get vaccinated, right. but if you want to go and use the public transport, you have to have a card to prove that you've been vaccinated. And I, I really don't see that as being a, a wild um, sort of science fiction kind of idea. Well, that is the slippery slope, of course, that starts as soon as you start even talking about having cards too. And I'm imagining that all of the information on that card goes directly to the CDC. And I'm not really a big fan of the CDC lately. They just have not really proven. I'm just saying they haven't really proven to me um, that they are trustworthy uh, in many ways. The other thing about it is that I'm thinking about what could possibly go wrong, right? Somebody says to you, I need to see your video and like tickets. <laughs> tickets, please. No ticket. <laughs> That's kind of what I thought of immediately. I thought, you know what, if they have all the information and they decide, you know, they, them, those, decide that they are going to, you know, insist that you carry this with you, what if you don't have it? I mean, it, as it is, it's hard enough for me to remember to carry my mask with me. Um, it was like, you know, the days that I left diaper bags behind and all of a sudden I had a, a, you know, something else to carry. I don't know. Anyway, so if you don't have your vaccine card with you, what happens? That's, I'm looking at the future. I'm also looking at the, the fact that all of this information is vulnerable. That's the part of it that really Really bothers me that anything that might be private, Rick, could just be, you know, exploited or used for bad purposes. Yeah. Well, and so it's. I think that there's an interesting um, relation of this to the concern for real ID, 
because these cards allegedly are just a, a paper card that are that's written on the back, but the data on the back then could be input uh, into any computer system and so forth. But they could just as well have RFD cards or something like that. But real ID, this is that whole thing that we have at, at the state and basically all the states where there's more or less a federal driver's license. It says your state, but if it goes according to all the federal guidelines. And in that real ID, there's an abundance of additional information that's available. Number one, just to get the card, there you have to contribute a lot more information. The other thing is that it's set up so that there could be an RFD or like a little a little tag, radio frequency tag, where you could have, and again, not science fiction, it's right there and people have <laughs> talked about it, people have proposed it yeah. and so far it hasn't caught on, but where information such as a vaccination history, I mean, you just it's it's in there uh, that any data that the government wants to put into that tag into your real id in other words your driver's license can go there so in my mind if they were going to do something with the uh, the the vaccination card as such to be a a passport of sorts what probably would make the most sense is simply to require that that information go into the real id uh, which now is going to allegedly be required October of 2021 to fly, which is why I'm going to keep my passport because I don't want a real ID. Well, I already have a real ID. I don't know what I was thinking, but I, I know, right? I know. But I also have a passport too. But I, 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 I'm always skeptical whenever that somebody's trying to track me. It, it puts my red flag up right away, and I was like, okay. Should I do this? And I was thinking that I'd be able to use my uh, real ID to fly easier domestically than carrying my passport with me all the time. But I don't, that's how they sold it to me and I fell for it, I guess. But um, <laughs> all right, we're, we're gonna wrap it up here. It's certainly been an adventure. This is a, this is a new thing. I kind of like this chair, not gonna lie, but I'm gonna relinquish it when you come back. But when we talk next, we will uh, have an in-studio guest on the next program. And I think you're gonna enjoy her. She's an L-O-A-V. And that's next on the next show with uh, No Apologies with Becker on Beck. In southwestern and south central North Dakota on any given day at any given moment, a Dakota Community Bank and Trust customer is logging in or signing on to do their online or mobile banking. We believe that community banking can blend both the past with down-home customer service in-house and the future with modern banking conveniences and technology for our customers anywhere, like here or here, all while honoring our long-standing tradition of community-first oriented banking here at Dakota Community Bank and Trust. This is President Leander McDonald, inviting you to pursue your education with us. For 50 years, we have served students from all backgrounds, including over 10,000 American Indian students from more than 75 federally recognized tribes. We are the first tribal college in the nation authorized to offer fully online degree programs. Eligible students may receive the Native American tuition waiver to cover tuition costs. Visit utdc.edu to see if you qualify. Leadership begins here, United Tribes Technical College. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. Howdy folks, it's the Caneline Cafe. I reckon it's time you'll do for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill, at a salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Caneline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink from trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. 
Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com.